Our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Exodus 3, 7 through 12. Starting in verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But <laughs> Moses said, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Please pray with me. Precious Lord Jesus, we thank you for enabling us to gather here together this morning. Our hope and our prayer is that this wouldn't just be an hour contained to Sunday morning, but instead it would spill out into a lifestyle of worshiping you and everything that we do. So Lord, with that, I am a broken and I am a sinful man. So my prayer is that you would get me out of the way. You would get me out of the way so that your words could come through me. Your words comforting us all, helping us all to grow, challenging all of us. Challenging us to answer the call that you have placed on our lives. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be found loving and acceptable to you. You, Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've all found ourselves in situations where we need rescuing, right? I'm reminded of a story of an atheist who found himself in one such situation. He was enjoying the view off of a beautiful cliff when all of a sudden a gust of wind knocked him over. Now fortunately he grabbed on to a little tuft of grass, but he was still dangling over and it became very apparent very quickly that this grass wasn't going to hold. So as his grip and the grass went, gave, started to give way, he looked up to the sky and he said, God, if you're there, please rescue me. To his great shock and amazement, he did hear a voice. The voice said, I am here. I will rescue you. Just let go of the grass. The man thought about it for a second. And then he looked back up and he said, is there someone else up there I can talk to? <laughs> Sometimes we're not rescued because we're not big fans of the rescue plan, right? This morning we're continuing a series entitled The Call with God's rescue plan for the Hebrew people while they're in slavery in Egypt. In the first part of the series we considered Abraham. And God calling Abraham, we are reminded that God's the ultimate promise keeper. This morning we're going to consider Moses. God calls Moses to be a rescuer. Specifically, God calls Moses to rescue the Hebrew people out of slavery. As we consider God's plan and God calling Moses into this plan of rescue, we can discern at least three phases. First, what was it about the situation that the Hebrew people found themselves in to make them ready for God to save them, to rescue them? Second, how does God set up this rescue plan? And then finally, how will this plan go forward? As we consider the ready, set, go of God's rescue plan, the answers to our questions are going to begin with the letter S to help with memory. So the first question is, what was it about the situation that the Hebrew people found themselves in when God calls Moses that made them ready? Ready for God to rescue them. God had not spoken since Genesis 46, 6. So what on earth caused God to break his silence? God tells Moses, when saying, I've seen the way 
that I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. God gives voice to the voiceless. God is a father to the fatherless. One of the ways we can very quickly stir up God's wrath is if we harm those who are voiceless and those who are vulnerable. We live in a world where there are many, many people who are voiceless and vulnerable. Globally, the most persecuted religious people group in the world are Christians. Just this past Easter, 200 of our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka were murdered on Easter Sunday. Entire villages in Nigeria and in the Congo are completely wiped out by terrorist groups like Boko Haram, and we hear nothing about it. I remember talking to one of my classmates from the Congo, and the horror stories are beyond belief. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are being slaughtered for their faith. They are truly the voiceless. It's one of the reasons why I love ministries like Voice of the Martyrs. If you haven't heard of them, I highly recommend checking them out. It's a wonderful ministry. Not only do they give a voice to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being persecuted, but they also discern ways to actually help them in the midst of their persecution, in the midst of their pain. Here in the U.S., we have children who are bought and sold in trafficking. We have other kids who are discarded like garbage by their parents. The most vulnerable, the most innocent among us, exploited, harmed, and sometimes even killed for the sake of convenience and money. This is one of the reasons why Brittany and I are so passionate about Royal Family Kids Camp, the Camp for Kids in Foster Care. We're also passionate about working with individuals and families with special needs, like doing Kingdom Sports Camp later. Those the world has forgotten, God remembers them. He is ready to rescue them. So, in what situation is God ready to come in as a rescuer? Our first task is for people to cry out in slavery. And whether this is slavery imposed by another or self-imposed slavery, God is ready to be our rescuer. From addictions to hurts to, to heart dispositions, we have all found ourselves enslaved at one time or another, haven't we? Amy Grant wrote a song called Better Than a Hallelujah, and it captures this well. Part of it goes like this. God loves a lullaby and a mother's tears in the dead of night, better than a hallelujah sometimes. God loves a drunkard's cry, the soldier's plea not to let him die, better than a hallelujah sometimes. We pour out our miseries. God just hears a melody. Beautiful the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts are better than a hallelujah. The woman holding on to life, the dying man giving up the fight, are better than a hallelujah sometimes. The tears of shame for what's been done, the silence when the words won't come, are better than a hallelujah. It's for this reason that the first step in AA is to admit that we're powerless over alcohol. They're, they're powerless over alcohol, and our lives become unmanageable. God is a rescuer to those who have admitted they've become sinaholics. God rescues those who cry out in the midst of slavery that they cannot save themselves. So what situations are ready for God to come in as a rescuer? Situations where people are crying out in the midst of slavery. So how does God set up this rescue plan? Does God like and share something on Facebook? Does he take to Twitter? Do you start a hashtag campaign? Or maybe he just sits back in heaven and complains about it, right? Someone ought to do something about that oppression. He does none of these things. He continues speaking to Moses, saying this, I have come down to rescue them, the Hebrew people, from the hand of the Egyptians. What's amazing is that God could have introduced himself, introduced himself to the Hebrew people in so many different ways, right? The almighty creator and king of the universe. The only good and just judge of all things. And these things would be true. But instead, God chooses to introduce himself. He chooses to be remembered as the rescuer of the Israelites. 
After this point, it's hard to read very far in the Old Testament without reading something that sounds like this. I am the Lord your God who rescued you out of slavery, the land of slavery, the land of Egypt. God's primary characteristic that He wants to communicate to His people is that He is a rescuer. Sometimes people will say that the difference between the Old and the New Testament is that the Old Testament is all about works and the New Testament is all about grace. But what did the Hebrew people do? What works did they do to earn being rescued out of slavery in Egypt? Nothing. They were rescued because God loved them. It was an act of sheer grace. The Hebrew people are encouraged to obey and follow God, not to earn His love, but because He has already loved them. He has taken a rabble of slaves. He rescues them and enables them to become a holy nation. In the same way, we too once were a rabble of slaves. Enslaved by selfishness. Enslaved by addiction, hurts, and hang-ups. But God didn't just sit back and say they ought to do something about their enslavement. Instead, He said, I am going to rescue them. And so He came down to the person of Jesus Christ to rescue us. Rescue us from our selfishness. Rescue us from our sinfulness. So that we, the rabble of slaves, could become, as Peter puts it in his first letter, a holy nation. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. Because once we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. How does God set up His rescue plan? Our second S is salvation by grace. One of the interesting things that we have in common with the Israelite slaves is that both of us are encouraged to be human doings rather than human beings. The only value that the Hebrew slaves had to Pharaoh is what they could do for him. That's how he could callously murder so many of their infants. In the same way, we are taught in our culture to only value others and only value ourselves in what we can do. I mean... Why is it that we think that whoever is the busiest is the most important person in the room? Like we're going to get some kind of prize for always doing something. Because of this, think about how mind-blowing it would have been when they found out the reason that God is rescuing them. Towards the end of our passage that we read, God says to Moses, once you rescue the people out of Egypt and bring them here to this mountain, why are they to be brought to the mountain? So they can build some pyramids for this God instead of Pharaoh? So that they can sacrifice their babies to Him? The common practice in that time and place? So they can come and do something for Him? No. He says, bring them here to this mountain so they can worship Me here at this mountain. In other words, God rescues us so that we can rest in His presence. We do work to serve and we do work to obey God. But we work and serve God not to be rescued, but because we have been rescued. We have been saved by grace through faith. And because of that, we want to be loyal. We want to follow God in gratitude. So, what if situations are, are, is God ready to rescue in? Ones where people are crying out in slavery. How does he set up this rescue plan? He saves us by grace through faith. How does this plan go forward? In my mind's eye, I can just see Moses nodding in agreement with God. When God says stuff like, I've seen the suffering of my people in Egypt, and I'm concerned for them, and I'm going to come and rescue them. At this point, I can see Moses saying, Amen, Lord. That's a great idea. Why don't you go do that? Right? But God doesn't stop there, does He? Instead, God has to keep on going. God says this, So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you can rescue my people out of Egypt. At this point, I think Moses felt a little bit like the atheist I mentioned earlier. The atheist said, Lord, is there someone else up there I can talk to? Moses says, Lord, is there someone else you can send? I mean, we're infamous for this in the church, aren't we? We see a problem in the church or outside the church and say, well, someone else should go take care of that, right? 
So how does God respond to Moses? Moses, when he says, God, you should send someone else to do it. Does, does God say, oh, you're right, I forgot you had a speech impediment. My bad, let me send someone else. No. Instead, he gives him the only equipping and the only qualification he really needs. In the face of Moses saying, I'm not equipped, I'm not qualified to do this, he says to Moses, you will be equipped, you will be qualified because I am with you. In this we see that God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. So how does God's rescue mission move forward? Our final S is that he sends us to those who are broken so that we can be agents of his rescue and his redemption. Notice that God doesn't tell us to only pray, although prayer is vitally important. He doesn't tell us to only give money, although financial support is vitally important as well. Instead, he says, go, go, I will send you to those who are hurting, those who are broken, and those who are lost, so that you can be an agent of my rescue, an agent of my redemption here on earth. I mean, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, we prayed it this morning, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, say it, on earth as it is in heaven. This means we are to roll up our sleeves and go out to the brokenhearted, those who are hurting, so they can experience God's love and grace and wholeness. One of the big hopes of House of the Carpenter working with this Acts program is that we can not just give stuff to the poor, but instead we can really form relationships and help people out of poverty. Not just putting a band-aid on the problem, but actually helping people in the midst of their hurts, in the midst of their struggles. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, where is God sending you? Is God sending you to house the carpenter to help? Is God sending you to another ministry like Kingdom Sports Camp to help with kids with special needs? There are so many different ways and so many different places in which God can send us on His rescue mission here on earth. So brothers and sisters in Christ, when God reveals to us His rescue plan, let's not just look up and say, is there someone else up there we can talk to? Instead, let's get ready, let's get set, and let's go. Let's get ready by asking God to open up our eyes to those who are enslaved around us. Let's get set by accepting and offering to others salvation by grace. And then finally, let's go by allowing God to send us on His rescue mission. Go by being sent into the darkness to shine Christ's light. Go by being sent to those who are brokenhearted so that they can experience God's wholeness. Go to those who are in despair so they can experience God's hope. Go to all those who are spiritually dead and fear physical death so that they can experience Christ's resurrection power. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for being our rescuer. Send us out so that we can be agents of your rescuing and redeeming as well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like